Yeah. Good morning. Once again, welcome to the campus of Flagler College and this exciting event that so many have played a very active hand in assembling. The freedom to teach, confronting complex themes in contested spaces. I wanted to begin once more by thanking our co-sponsors. The event partners are numerous, listed on the back. It's not disingenuous to say that this event would not have happened, could not happen without the support of everyone who has a passion about these topics, who have a, has a passion about education and have volunteered their time and resources to come to St. Augustine and participate in this unique forum. Florida Humanities, the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance and Abolition at Yale University, the Institute for Common Power, the National Council for History Education, and the National Humanities Center, along with Duke University History Department, Dr. McLean, have been instrumental in helping develop the program and contributing to the development of everything that we have. If last night was any indication, this is gonna be an incredible event. I told Derek and Tammy, thank you, but also thank you, question mark, for setting the bar so incredibly high for all of the panelists that will inevitably follow in an incredible shadow that they cast uh, in terms of the dialogue, in terms of the reflection, in terms of the questions, the thought uh, that really permeated this auditorium last night. I am obligated to read a disclaimer from one of our partners, Florida Humanities, and that is that funding for this program was provided through a sponsorship from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed at this conference do not necessarily represent those of Florida Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. A quick announcement uh, for our event partners. We have limited table space, the faults mine and mine alone, for this morning. So if you have materials, we do have a table where you can put your materials, but please don't feel obligated to table today. Our connecting spaces exhibit time tomorrow is where most of our materials will be uh, individual, individualized with separate tables. So again, my apologies for that miscommunication. Um, as I said, the fault is mine and mine alone. If you don't believe me, ask Ms. Santos, she'll tell you that. Again, welcome to Flagler, and I think what I wanted to do this morning to begin the event is to turn the microphone over to Dr. David Blight, because one of the questions that we have received quite frequently is how? How did this happen? Why you, Butler? Why GLC, David Blight? Notice I used both names for him, but just the last name for me. And I think what David can do is provide a little bit of context for how this really came together in a relatively short amount of time. So, Dr. Blight. Uh, well, Butler, um, you did that disclaimer in a very nice radio voice. I mean, you could have another career. I don't think you, should, you shouldn't have another career. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning out on the internet. Good morning here. Thank you all for coming. I feel like I'm in an opera house here. This is amazing. Uh, anybody gonna do an aria here at some point? Um, first of all, uh, you know, we'll do a lot of these, but we'll keep them shorter as the days go on. Uh, Michael Butler's energy and courage to pull off this conference is a lot of why we're here. Uh, so join me. This may happen later, but a thank you to Michael.
and the staff here at uh, Flagler. Um, out in the tables back there, you are going to find a variety of things. And one of them are buffer stickers that say, trust the teachers. We even have a banner that's probably 10 feet long that we used last year at our conference. If any of you tuned in online, you saw that banner. Um, last fall's conference at the Gilder Lehrman Center at Yale was a, an incubation moment for this conference. Michael was one of our speakers. Others from Florida, there are in fact already a couple high school teachers here from Florida who were last year at our event. Welcome back. Um, well, I'm welcoming you back to Florida. No. Um, uh, we did a conference called Teaching Race and Slavery in the American Classroom, and, and we rooted it in this idea of uh, trusting teachers who should control the curriculum, not the parents. Sorry, a lot of you are parents, and I, and I love parents, especially my own. But uh, curriculum belongs to professionals, and the classroom belongs to teachers. Um, and we tried last year to, to focus that conference, as we're doing here, around teachers, around the situations, the circumstances, the plights they face. I have some sense of that. I spent the first seven years of my career as a high school teacher in my hometown of Flint, Michigan. I still maintain it's the most important teaching I ever, I've ever done uh, with kids from that industrial city, mostly working class, although Flint had a very solid middle class in those years. Flint had a great school system in those years. Flint is in trouble now, as you may have heard, not just because of water, because of deindustrialization. Uh, three of the four large high schools are now closed. And the one I the one I went to and the one I taught in are both closed. Um, probably soon to be demolished. But that's a depressing story. Let's talk about some hope. Um, I wrote an essay in the uh, Atlantic, and I, I thought it was just a year ago. It turns out it was November of 21. It's almost two years ago. That was entitled Trust the Teachers. And I tried to make the argument. Uh, this was at the beginning of what is happening so much here in Florida with education, public education, the whole idea of how to teach history, et cetera, et cetera. And the piece was simply to, to, to draw attention and support for classroom teachers. And again, the challenges they face. What do teachers most want? I can't speak for all teachers by any means, but you can add to this list. Um, they need autonomy. They need a sense of community. They need respect. They need a sense of community and collective and professional trust. They need time to read. They need time to learn something new. I mean, mo most of us in teaching, and I've taught now at four or five colleges and universities. I mean, you know, especially early in your career, you're writing those lectures the night before and sometimes the morning of. And if you're lucky, it has an ending on it before you walk in. Uh, although mine still don't always have an ending on them before I walk in. Um, teachers want support for their intellectual lives, as well as for the practical challenges they have in a classroom. As, as so many of you know, because you do it, um, there's no more challenging job in the United States than facing a room full of 14-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 8-year-olds, whatever, or for that matter, hot-shot, ambitious 20-year-olds at a university where they all think they're going to rule the world anyway. Uh, and I still get incredibly nervous the first day of class of any term. I, 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 you know, you always think I'm going to fail. I always think I probably did on the first day. And that's good. And, but not all professions are like that. I mean, many are. Um, we've been doing teacher institutes for actually decades now, uh, we being historians. Uh, you know, the NEH started doing them. Um, there was the Teach for America grants for about 10 years out of the education department, which brought 
teacher institutes of all kinds about American history to thousands of teachers and programming all over the country until that ended. And then the Gilder Lehrman Institute uh, in New York, uh, created in the mid 90s, has done hundreds of teacher institutes in the summer. I've done them for at least 25 years, at least one every summer. And in fact, it's I don't, I don't tell my Yale students this, but it's the most fun teaching I ever do. And there's nobody more motivated than a, than a middle school or high school teacher who gets to come and spend a, a week at Yale, fuss around in the archives. And every, how, many, how many times do teachers ever get to go to an archive ever have time? But they get to sit in a room, read, talk to each other, and be treated like real intellectuals. And I keep thinking about that in this moment we're living through, this political attack, let's be, let's be honest here, this political wedge issue that has been made out of teaching and out of history and out of the subjects we teach as though we don't know what we're doing. And one of the arguments I made in that piece in The Atlantic was, okay, right-wing America, Moms for Liberty, or whatever you want to call yourselves, come after us. Come after the dozens and dozens and dozens of American historians, the best in the country, who teach these teacher institutes every summer and, and enjoy doing it and never say no. I, I, I don't know anybody who's ever been asked, well, we get paid, but well, we should. We put in a week and it's kind of around the clock. Okay, but blame us because we've been taking the best history of the last half century to teachers. And if you think, the teaching of American history is screwed up. Stop blaming the teachers. Bring it on us. Of course, nobody did that. No, nobody's invited, you know, four or five top historians of this subject or that subject to meet with the school board of the Department of Education of the state of Florida or the state of Texas or the state of Tennessee or for the state of Connecticut, for that matter, and just have it out. What is history? What is good history? How, how should it be taught? Why is history a little dangerous? I said, bring it on, and I don't know. They haven't brought it on yet. I think they should. Um, history's not a fable, is it? At least we kind of hope to train ourselves to not believe it's some kind of fable, some kind of melodrama, with just enough heroes, just enough villains, and a good ending. That's not history, but it's what it turns out millions of people still want. James Baldwin had a line for this. Uh, it's in a piece he wrote in 1962. And he's going on and on about how Americans don't have a sense of history, and, which was one of Baldwin's favorite subjects and so on and so forth. And at one point he just says, and it's a remarkable uh, metaphor, he says, the trouble with the way Americans deal with their history is they use it to cover up the sleeper, but never to wake him up. Cover the sleeper. Give us some history that makes us sleep well at night. It's not going to give me any troubled dreams or bother me or, oh my goodness, make me aware of some troubles in the past. I'm not trying to be flippant here, but this is an attitude that is very old. It's as old as the first epic ever written about history. <laughs> Just give me a history I like. Give me the history I want to live in. Give me the history that says my grandfather was cool. Yeah, tell me that other stuff. Or my great, 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 great grandmother was cool. Uh, purpose of history is not to make us feel good it might it's full of triumphs it's it's full of amazing achievement at the same time it's full of all the horrible uh, foibles of human nature one of my favorite lines about this is from w.e.b du bois it's a quote kind of buried toward the end of the last chapter of the soul uh, excuse me of black reconstruction in 1935 it's that last chapter Du Bois called The Propaganda of History, which was his um, quite serious take on what had happened to the writing or understanding of the history of Reconstruction. And it's kind of a historiographical essay, but, it, it, 
But suddenly there's this passage that is, to me, always unforget. I can never get it memorized, so I wrote it down today. Nations reel and stagger on their way. They make hideous mistakes. They commit frightful wrongs. They do great and beautiful things. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all of this, so far as the truth is ascertainable? That is such a simple statement, but it doesn't get much better than that. Nations, he says, they do terrible things, and they do beautiful and wonderful things. Let's just find both. And if there's not, if there's an imbalance between those two, so be it. Now I sound like I'm pleading here. I'm not pleading with you, but I'm, you know, who knows? We might get heard out there because of live streaming. We might get heard. We're trying to get heard. Not because we're trying to condemn anybody. But we are trying to make an argument. We are trying to fight back with the, the poor methods we have. We don't have millions and millions of dollars to throw back at the other side in this debate about who controls history, who controls classrooms, what ought to be taught, et cetera, et cetera. But we have our voices. We have our pens. And we need to support teachers. William James, in the great William James, philosopher of the late 19th, early 20th century, went and gave three lectures, or was it four, called Talks to Teachers in 1899. 1899. This is not a new problem. And that was the turn of the 20th century, massive immigration to the United States, massive problems with urbanization, industrialization. You know, that's textbook stuff. And all these new immigrants, I mean, the school in America was becoming this, well, now what are we going to do with all these people, all these diverse people, all these Slavic peoples from Europe? Oh, God, what's going to happen? Italians, how are they going to learn to be Americans? And then, of course, the, the race problem is everywhere. Uh, and they were trying to imagine a public school that was now going to be both the, the great method of assimilation, but also education, civic education, how much civic education. That's not a debate that's ever ended. What is the purpose of that school? Is it essentially to create citizens? Is it essentially to create just human beings who can read a Shakespeare play and realize that there's nothing new under the sun because Shakespeare already said it over and over. I had a colleague recently, uh, well, I won't, go into, I won't go into it. I had an epigraph on a draft of a chapter. Where I just finished writing the history of Yale and slavery, and I, I used a Shakespeare quote as an epigraph on one of the chapters. The colleague was right. It didn't really fit. But she said, you can't use Shakespeare. He's too Western. I said, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Shakespeare's Shakespeare. He ain't Western, he ain't Eastern, he ain't Northern, he ain't Southern. I, hell, he's British because that's where all those kings were. But anyway, we get too obsessed a bit, don't we, with our categories. Uh, but James and his, these incredible, this is William James, the Harvard professor. He didn't have to go out and talk to teachers, but he did. And I always loved those lectures. And in it, you can boil it down. He says, okay, there are three things that teachers need. He says, you need tact. Tact. Uh, tact in front of students. You need, you need some method. You need to, you need to reach them. <laughs> you, you don't want to beat them over the head every day. You want to gather them in and help them learn something. Tact, he said. And we all know what that means. It's, it's an undefinable thing, isn't it? Oh, I had good tact today, or I didn't have good tact today. Secondly, he said, you need ingenuity. Oh, God. Define that. On a given Tuesday, how's your ingenuity? Uh, you know, you do. Teaching a room full of kids? I, I used to make jokes about how, God, today I had to do cartwheels to get their attention. And, well, I don't do cartwheels, but I did the equivalent. Uh, and then he said... Lo and behold, you need knowledge of your subject. 
no kidding. You need to know something. And the best teachers do. Best teachers have all of those things. And then James ended with this simple line. He says, teachers of this country have its future in their hands. That's 1899. And you still do. We still do. Uh, but there, there, there's, a, there's a movement out there that wants to control what we do. Um, back to where we started here, uh, I want to say simply that the conference we did last fall at Yale was, was a, we had a great time. It was an important gathering of folks. Uh, and out of that came conversations with Michael. What if we did a kind of follow-up at Flagler? I said, hey, all right. Well, well, we're on board. Let's let's go, and it has been a roller coaster ride. But here we are. And thank you to all the Flagler staff. Thank you to the Flagler president who said yes. Um, and thank you to my staff, uh, some of whom are here. Michelle Zacks, who caught COVID five days ago, he, she's our associate director and played a major role in planning this conference. Is out there on live. Michelle, we love you. Sorry you're not here. She was emailing me last night during the session. David, get the water bottles up there. I mean, no, no, Mike just did. I mean, come on. It's like a thousand miles away, and she's, you know, usual, as usual, telling me what to do, which good thing she does. Uh, Daniel Vera, whom you don't see much, but he's, he's running all of our technology. He's our media person at the GLC at Yale, without whom we couldn't function. And when the pandemic hit, whoa, was he valuable. <laughs> <laughs> he's still valuable. Daniel, I don't know where you are, but if, if you're visible, wave. Uh, he's running all of our live streaming and other things with his partner here, Peter from Flagner, Flagler. And Daisha Brabham, who is our education director at uh, Daisha Wave, at least. She's, she's, she's got the, the minute signs which says, wrap up, David. That's what that says. Okay, I'm wrapping up. Uh, but I just want to thank my own staff who are fantastic folks. And I'll ask point because it's partly about Daisha. Um, we're, an, we're a research institute for the study of slavery and abolition across all borders and all time, all over the world. We have it's at least six research fellows in any given time. Apply. Seriously. Derek, if you're here from last, I, I want you to apply for a fellowship, Derek Black. I don't control all of them. But um, but we do a great deal of outreach to teachers, and we always have, and uh, that's why we're here. Uh, the purpose of a place like Yale University and dozens of others are to create knowledge, but is to take that knowledge out off the campus and bring the world into the campus and not always just look at ourselves. Um, thank you all for coming. And now Michael is going to introduce our colleague, Nancy McLean, who's also had an incredible role in planning this conference, who's gonna give us this morning's keynote. Thank you. Before I introduce Nancy, though, I'd like to introduce someone else who has been instrumental in uh, the support of this event, and that's our college president, John Delaney. Um, president Delaney is someone that I've gotten to know over the planning of this event and even before. And I've worked under a few college presidents and I've never had the experience in which at our first session, instead of asking, who are you? What do you teach? President Delaney launched into a conversation about the importance of academic freedom, the importance of freedom of speech and the difference between the two. And from there, we had a robust discussion about these concepts, about what do you teach, why do you teach it, how do you teach it, and what is the intended outcome. I cannot tell you how thankful I am to have a president who recognizes those elements that are so vital to us as educators. So I would like to introduce to you Flagler College President John Delaney. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, it's uh, been a delight to get to know Mike and uh, really become friends. Um, some years ago, I was president uh, of a regional public university, uh, the University of North Florida in Jacksonville. 
And uh, we discovered um, that one of our students, about 17,000 students, but one of our political science students was not only a member of the Ku Klux Klan, but was whatever the Grand Poobah of a Klan is, got some name for it, uh, for North Florida. And there was outrage ensuing. It got out. The students began to get concerned. Um, he was interesting. He was uh, older. He was 37. He'd been in the Navy and came out. And he himself had studied free speech. And he knew what he could do on campus and what he couldn't. And he was always polite, held open doors and those kinds of things. But his membership as a Klansman obviously was, was concerning. And I'm an attorney. So I met with our attorneys. Well, what, what, what can we do about this? You know, we can't have a Klansman on campus. And uh, ended up bringing in an outside attorney. And one of them sat down and said, John, we could walk around campus wearing a white hood with a Confederate flag draped across his back, carrying a noose, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. And what it made me do was really sort of look back at the First Amendment. Um, he later did something stupid, and we were able to kick him off campus, um, unrelated to his membership in the Klan. And uh, interestingly, the last reports were that um, he had repented of being in the Klan and joined a black church. Um, my African-American staffers said, well, I'll believe it when I see it. They didn't believe it, but uh, apparently he'd had a change and was transferring someplace else. But it made me really take a look at the importance of that First Amendment. And I'll go one other quick anecdote. Some years ago, I saw an actor um, on TV on one of these talk shows, and he was condemning the then president of the United States. I wouldn't even say who. And just every time he had a shot, he would take a take a shot at the president. And then they brought other guests in and he moves down the couch and he continued to do it. He interrupted just to take another shot of the president of the United States. And about two years ago, I read another interview of, of him. I read this interview and he's answering all these questions about his career. And one of the last questions was, how, what would you like to be remembered for? And his answer was tolerance. And what hit me is it's easy to be tolerant of those whose ideas you share. But what higher ed is about is those clash of ideas. It's confronting those and laying those out. That doesn't mean you don't condemn bigotry or hatred, you know, on some of the key principles that help the, the condemnation of which is some of the key principles of which help build this country. But it's about those conflicts. One of the best things I did in my life, and I'll really close with this, was when I was in high school, uh, got transferred in my junior year. My dad got transferred my junior year, so I hardly knew anybody. And the school was starting up a debate team. And I said, oh, what the heck, let me go out and see what this is about. And what debate at the time, I'm assuming it's the same format. They would pick a topic. Reforming the welfare system was, was one year. And in the debates, one side, you would say the pro, yes, you should reform it. The other was the, the counter. In the next debate, you had to flip sides. And it helped me in my legal career as a litigator, because what you always wanted to do is anticipate what is the other side going to say about this? And that debate, that exposure, the idea of taking a look at both sides, I think is healthy. Um, and too much in this country, I think we've moved where one side of the political spectrum wants to censor the other side. And really what we need to do is to open that up. And I think that, that this format, that what Mike has de designed with our faculty from faculty colleagues from up north is just a brilliant, brilliant thing and what higher ed should be about. So thank you for your attending. Thanks for the presenters for participating. And thank you for being on campus. We've got alumni weekend now, which is why I'm kind of popping in and out. So look forward to seeing some of you over the next couple of days. God bless you. Thanks. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Nancy McLean. Dr. McLean is the William H. Chef Distinguished Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University. Dr. McLean received her MA and her BA simultaneously at Brown University and her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Modern US history, particularly political economy, public policy history, social movements, and Southern history are her areas of specialty. She's the author of five original monographs, including Freedom is Not Enough, The Opening of the American Workplace, and a text that really shaped what I knew about the 20th century Ku Klux Klan when I was preparing for my comprehensive exams, Behind the Mask of Chivalry, The Making of the Second Ku Klux Klan. 
Her work has appeared in numerous prestigious forums, such as the Journal of American History, Feminist Studies, The Nation, The Boston Review, the list goes on and on and on. Professor McLean has also shared her exp expertise and insights with a broader audience through frequent media appearances and as a guest on shows such as Democracy Now!, Real Time with Bill Maher, and The Readout with Joy Reid. Her scholarship has received numerous accolades and has been supported by nearly as many fellowships. Her service to the profession is exceeded only by her service to American democracy, which is underscored by her most recent book, Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Rights Stealth Plan for America. Please join me then in welcoming our keynote, a decorated scholar, teacher, and mentor, a person most qualified to speak of the issues this conference confronts, and a colleague in arms and humor who's become a true friend since we met just under a year ago, Dr. Nancy McLean. Welcome. Good morning. You can do better than that. All right, good, good morning. It is so good to be with you. I am thrilled uh, to be here with you today. We, the organizing uh, team behind this conference are so grateful to all of you for coming. It already feels like a milestone after last night's riveting conversation between Tammy Fields and uh, Derek Black. And uh, as he reflected on his life-changing experience as a student at New College of Florida, uh, and also after this morning's uh, openings by professors uh, Butler and, and Blight, um, and they're welcome. So thank you so much for that generous introduction. Mike. Um, and I should say that both of our speakers this morning were rather self-effacing. <laughs> so I will just add that uh, Professor Blight is the Sterling Professor of History at Yale and the incoming president of the Organization of American Historians. Um, and that Professor Blight, I mean, Professor Butler is the Keenan Distinguished Professor of History here at Butler, uh, where he has worked for 15 years. And I was with him yesterday going around campus, and it was rather like traveling with the mayor in a small town. So much love and friendship friendship and admiration for his deep commitment to this, this university. And I have to say that personally, I am in awe of Professor Butler for the vision and the courageous leadership and talent he has shown in bringing us here together this weekend. If you don't know him, you will want to. He is whip smart, omnicompetent, and hilarious to boot. He is also a superb scholar citizen, deeply committed to bringing knowledge, as uh, David Blight was saying, bringing knowledge uh, outside of the academy and the latest research into the community, uh, which he has done for many years here in St. Augustine, and which actually helped lead to his going to Yale uh, for that conference last year and to this, because something he was supposed to do for teachers on civil rights history was shut down by people who were afraid uh, of getting on the wrong side of the new law. Uh, so for almost a year now, Professor Butler has shown inspiring vision and superhuman organizing skill to bring together this exciting, informative, and inspiring program, and to make sure we were all fed and watered and comfortable, as I trust you are. Um, he could not have done this without the generous assistance from others at Flagler College, and I especially want to recognize Ms. Jasmine Santos, who has been extraordinary, and Ms. Susan Connor. Beyond Flagler, as, as um, Mike mentioned, we have counted on the support of Yale's uh, Gilder Lehrman Center, headed by Professor David Blight and on the peerless uh, knowledge and talent of his associate director, Michelle Zachs, in designing powerhouse conferences. Michelle anticipated everything, everything except getting COVID. So we are heartbroken that she cannot be here with us uh, as a result, but we are, I'm sure she is watching now. And I just like to ask people to just wave to Michelle, who worked so hard. She sent you so many letters. She was really uh, such, such a gift to all of us. Okay, but now let's be clear. This is no ordinary conference uh, because these are no ordinary times. 15 years ago, none of us 
could have imagined the cascading horrors we are seeing regularly in these times, or the climate of legal jeopardy and intimidation in which so many educators must now operate. You will hear firsthand testimony over the next few days of what many have endured. Uh, and I will just uh, evoke a little of that with uh, something I hope will work here, but it's, where's my friend, Daniel? Maybe I don't have it on. Uh, Daniel, nothing's happening. <laughs> We'll catch up. He'll be on the slides. Okay, so some images of the kinds of things happening at school boards uh, and facing teachers. But we've come here today, in fact, many from very far away, because we share the values that guide good education and make for a healthy democracy. We believe in the inherent worth and dignity of each child, uh, indeed, of every person. We believe in the common good. We believe in a fair society that gives all a chance to thrive. We believe in honesty, even when it's painful, because we know that facing the truth is the only way to grow, both for individuals and societies. The participants in this conference are people deeply committed to their work and their communities. They are award-winning teachers, scholars, museum staff, journalists, and librarians. But we are also here because we have witnessed escalating attacks on our values and on the institutions and practices that uphold them. Indeed, as you will hear over these next three days, many committed educators have found themselves suddenly in the eye of a bewildering storm. Many have been targeted personally, often with heart-stopping cruelty, simply for doing the jo their jobs in the way that they were trained to do, as professionals with accuracy and with inclusive regard for every child, every child, not just those whose feelings and families are favored in recent legislation as in centuries of history. You will also hear from those like me who have done research that helps explain what otherwise seems so mysterious. Like, why would anyone want to turn such firepower against our common schools? Indeed, why would anyone speak in military language about education, as Christopher Rufo, a newcomer to Florida, did when he said, and I quote, the right is laying siege to the institutions. The right is laying siege to the institutions. From soon after America was founded, after all, at least in the free states that abolished slavery, and later in the South, thanks to Reconstruction, public schools were seen as vital to the success of democratic self-government and to the building of a vibrant economy with social mobility. Why the turnaround? To make sense of it, we will be discussing matters that go far deeper than policy questions about teaching and learning. They concern who we are, who we are as a people, and what is happening to our country, to our democracy, and even to our common home, this earth for which there is, as the young climate activists say, no planet B. For here's something we all need to know. The United States no longer ranks among the strongest democracies in the world. We have tumbled down the ratings, uh, down the rankings to the position of, and I quote, imperiled democracy with Hungary, Poland, and Slovenia. Can I get the next slide, please? What? Just point. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I guess I wasn't pushing hard. Okay. Whoops. No, 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 no. Now we're getting slide two. Ah, there we go. What the? Yeah, you might have to hang with me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I need to go forward too. Okay. Um, please don't go. Actually, can I just? Yeah, no. <laughs> I'll just I'll just talk to Daniel when, when I need another slide. Okay, so this is really serious, right? We have slid to an imperiled democracy and we have joined some new autocracies. 
So today I want to share with you some of the history that helps us to understand the intimate connection between the attacks on the freedoms to teach, learn, and read, and the new fragility of our democratic system. Because what I have learned in my own research is that it is the same actors and organizations who are laying siege to both, to our public schools on the one hand, and on the other hand, to our governing institutions and laws. Those two hands, if you will, are now working so closely together that what is happening on one front cannot be understood without the other. In fact, the people who are seeking to enchain democracy, as my, my book title puts it, quoting one of them, uh, are the same people orchestrating the attacks on public education. And the same legislatures that are restricting the freedom to teach and to learn and to read are also restricting the right to vote and to have a real choice in who will represent your district. That tells us a lot. My friends, for all the talk of parents' rights these days, the reality is at odds with the rubric. What we are seeing is not a matter of ordinary parents joining together in an organic way to address local problems, nor is it even a matter of partisan politics, of ambitious politicians seeking an edge with voters who possessed a pre-existing concern. After all, if these attacks were really arising from particular local community situations, then why are we seeing educational gag orders uh, springing up in state after state in close synchroni synchronicity from Virginia to Florida and other states of the former Confederacy to Arizona, Idaho and the Dakotas, uh, Iowa, Wisconsin and more. Next slide. Uh, in fact, it's not random synchronicity at all, but choreography. Choreography from top-down, undemocratic national organizations like the Orwellianly named Moms for Liberty and Parents Defending Education, which we'll hear more about after lunch from my colleague, uh, Isaac Kamola. Behind the folksy monikers are multi-million dollar war chests quickly assembled not from worried parents, but from huge, long-active, dark money donors on the radical right. This is not the PTA or the NEA or the AUP running on dues. These groups are underwritten by interested parties. And lo, the donor-amassed war chests are not only being used to deny our freedoms and turn parents against teachers and books, they are also being used to drive the defunding of public education, higher education and K-12 schools. They are being used to, at, uh, for, in attacks on unions, for the takeover of the governance of colleges and universities, and more. These efforts are being fostered from the top down out of the view of the news cameras. That matters. The imposed nature of all this is also evident in how unpopular it is. Far from responding to some deep surge in popular opinion, it is going against public opinion, trying to force a change in that opinion. I mean, after all, in a world in which technology advances faster than we can keep up with it, witness my encounter with the gizmo, uh, who could possibly see benefit in banning books? Most parents don't. They want their kids to be prepared for the challenging world ahead. Yet censorship is surging. In the last two years, the American Library Association has documented book ban attempts that have far surpassed in number and intensity those of the previous 20 years when they started keeping track. Next slide, please. Uh, what is going on here? Polls repeatedly find that most people disapprove of such suppression. One big poll in 2022 found a whopping 78% of Americans oppose book bans, 50% strongly. That supermajority includes Republicans and independent voters. Even more striking, a poll by Heart Research Associates in December 2022 found that by a four to one margin, more voters want investment in public schools than want more school choice. I'm going to repeat that because it's really important to keep in mind. By a four to one margin, more voters want investment in public schools than want more school choice. 
Hold that four to one statistic in mind as I proceed, because it offers us crucial evidence that something is very fishy in all of this. Indeed, if this siege on education is frowned upon by such majorities, why does it continue? That's a paradox, right? And the one I'd like to use the remainder of my time to address. Because in their coverage of what is happening, most pundits are unaware of the deeper history that solves this mystery. As a historian, I'd like to suggest a different way of understanding what's unfolding across the country, an analysis that points to actors and events rarely in media reports about what is being done to our schools. So let me go first for the big picture, then to some early history I found that explains how undermining public education seemed crucial to the cause I'll talk about from the outset, and then in closing, I will circle back to today's attacks on education in the fresh light that history sheds, where I hope we'll be able to see with a new kind of x-ray vision once we have the context. So behind and propelling the attacks on public education is a deliberate and astonishingly well-funded movement with a radical libertarian ideology. Its dogma is so extreme that the conservative movement luminary William F. Buckley Jr., founder of the National Review magazine, denounced it early on as, and I quote, anarcho-totalitarianism, anarcho-totalitarianism. I'm speaking, next slide, please, of the libertarian cause led by Charles Koch, the CEO of Koch Industries, and the network of hundreds of billionaire and multimillionaire donors he has assembled in recent years. Now, that's quite an assertion, and you may be skeptical. I understand that. But let me assure you, it is well documented now, not only in my, my own most recent book, but in those of other scholars and award-winning journalists, above all the work of Jane Mayer, the author of Dark Money and many investigative pieces since. So stay with me as I share more and feel free to raise any challenges afterward. This libertarian cause was founded back in the 1970s, gathered force in the 1980s, doubled down in the 1990s, sharply accelerated in 2009, and since 2021 is reaching a crescendo. This movement's attacks on public institutions from education to election administration, public health, public lands, and government agencies are part of an audacious plan to transform our country. Few people understand just how extreme a cause uh, Koch leads. That is not least because they have invested in wordsmithing to frame as palatable what would otherwise make most people gag. For such arch libertarians, government has only three legitimate functions, providing for the national defense, ensuring the rule of law, particularly law to protect property rights, and maintaining social order. The easy to remember summary of that, armies, courts, and police. Armies, courts, and police. That means a country without public education, without social security or Medicare, without protections from discrimination, and without environmental protection, among other public goods libertarians would have us all live without. The libertarian ideologues and their ultra-rich patrons seek over time to impose total personal responsibility on, on the people. Next slide, please. It would be basically a world of untrammeled corporate. Oop, that was out of order. Sorry, there should be a list. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it would be a world of untrammeled corporate domination because democracy is the only thing strong enough at least potentially, to protect us from subjugation, which they call liberty. They even have had the nerve recently to rebrand themselves as the freedom movement. From early on, Charles Koch and his core strategists knew that they could never achieve their goals in the old-fashioned way by sharing their ideas with the public and convincing people uh, to vote for what they wanted to do, slowly building majorities. Who would vote to end Social Security? or sell off the national parks for oil drilling. Seeing that they would fail at getting public opinion on their side, they set out to enchain democracy. What do they mean by that? The political economist James McGill Buchanan, the previous slide, uh, laid it out in his writings. A white, 
the one that came before the, the man, uh, a white Tennessean who moved to Virginia in the 1950s. He went on to become the first U.S. Southerner to win the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences and to advise all the major organizations on the, the right, uh, including those funded by Charles Koch, who also invested in Buchanan's work uh, at George Mason University and his program. Buchanan's greatest gift to the right was this advice. He said, if you don't like the outcome of the political process over a long period of time, and here, honestly, I'm not exaggerating, and I am a historian, you have to realize libertarians don't like the 20th century's worth of public policy and the 21st. So he said, if you don't like the outcome of the political process over a long period of time, stop fixating on who rules, particular candidates, their parties, et cetera, and instead focus on the rules and how you might change the rules to get what you want, then lock in the new rules with constitutional change. Remake the judiciary and the law. Rewrite the rules so that we will no longer be a de democratic nation in the way that we have been uh, over our lifetimes. Uh, so that they can ram their agenda through, even though most of us would be horrified to learn of the true goals. The fundamental changes Buchanan advised would ultimately be so radical that he himself said they amounted to a constitutional revolution, his phrase, to be achieved through amendments. And in fact, the Koch network and its allies in state legislatures are pushing for a constitutional convention they hope to hold as soon as 2025. Common Cause has said it's the greatest threat to democracy flying almost completely under the radar. Slide, please, with the map. In the run-up to that audacious gambit, Buchanan and his colleagues suggested a range of measures like those we have seen roll out since 2010, measures that would grease the way for a constitutional convention by constricting the people's power. They include such things as destruction of labor unions, using measures like voter ID to uh, discourage uh, political participation, uh, Voter, voter photo IDs to discourage political participation by people of low wealth and young voters, students in particular, practicing extreme redistricting to overrepresent conservative rural voters and underrepresent uh, cities and suburbs, ending campaign finance uh, restrictions, and more. What we are seeing then is a meticulously constructed plan, decades in the making, to fundamentally change the relationship between the people and our government, and to do so permanently, to protect the most predatory of corporate interest. Charles Koch himself said to his grantees when he launched this effort in earnest in 1997, uh, slide please, since we are greatly outnumbered, the failure to use our superior technology ensures failure. Koch has three engineering degrees from MIT. When he talks about technology, he's talking about ideas. And they know, precisely because they know they are a tiny minority that could not win without applying the technology of rigging the rules of the game, uh, that is why they are doing this. It has not been Koch alone, of course, though his nearly uh, 700 allied donors at last count trust him and his advisors to invest their funds wisely. They just, we've been told by reports, hand it over and say, Charles, you have the plea. Charles, you know what to do. Not just Charles, but the team of, of uh, uh, advisors and, and operations he works with. Okay, so what is this technology that has enabled them to amass such stunning power? For one, assistance from an infrastructure of literally hundreds of organizations funded by these arch-right donors who seek to remake our country. Slide, please. The anti-democratic infrastructure now includes dozens of ostensibly separate national bodies, such as the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and the American Legislative Exchange Council, known as ALEC. It also includes over 150 state-level groups that align their efforts through the state policy network, like Florida's Foundation for Government Accountability and James Madison Institute. It also includes organizing enterprises such as Americans for Prosperity, Stand Together, Concerned Veterans for America, the Libre Initiative aimed at Latinos, and Generation Opportunity aimed at youth. This cause has a legal wing that includes the Federalist Society, which for more than four decades now has been working to change laws, alter interpretation of the Constitution, and groom and seat 
judges who would act on that altered interpretation. There are now six Federalist Society associated judges on the Supreme Court who make up the majority. So too, the Koch donor network funds litigation outfits that have brought us such precedent shredding Supreme Court's at, uh, decisions as Citizens United, which opened the spigots to mounting flows of untraceable corporate money in our politics, Shelby County, which enabled mass voter suppression, Janus uh, to undermine labor unions in the public sector, West Virginia versus EPA, which endangers all federal rulemaking on the environment, and Dobbs, which took away women's reproductive freedom and awarded the Christian nationalists whose votes the radical libertarian right needs to achieve its agenda. Slide, please. Backing these efforts are Koch-funded faculty uh, and centers at many colleges and universities across the country, now over 300. In Florida alone, Koch funds centers at Florida State University, Florida Atlantic University, Florida International University, and the state flagship, the University of Florida. By implanting it, such ideological hubs in public institutions by legislative fiat, the right is creating what Christopher Rufo has called, and I quote, a patronage system, a patronage system for the right. Rufo was blunt, we, and he, I'm quoting, we defund things we don't like, we fund things we do like. Slide, please. This is not disinterested philanthropy by the donors. This is investment in future profitability. From the very beginning of his investment in education in the 1970s, Charles Koch argued that businessmen should support only those programs, departments, or schools that contribute in some way to their individual companies or to the general welfare of the free enterprise system. He explained that they should invest, and I quote, the company's money to ensure against the political loss of any opportunity to make a profit, to ensure against the political loss of any opportunity to make a profit, like action on the climate crisis, taxation, regulation. Why is curbing democracy so urgent for Charles Koch and his allied donors? because fossil fuel production is at the core of Coke Industries. Now one of the largest privately held corporations in the world, it has made him one of the world's 20th, 20 richest men. And the donors that Coke has gathered to transform our world tend to come from what Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island calls dirty industries. Those facing regulation, hence profit loss for the harms they inflict on innocent people. Not only fossil fuels, but also tobacco, industrial agriculture, and shady operators in the financial sector. Charles Koch's grantees have worked to organize them all for what one political scientist calls wealth defense. For his part, Koch is deadly serious about ensuring fossil fuel profits far into the future. That is why Koch chose to become also the world's leading funder of climate science denial, having outpaced, slide please, uh, even the likes of Exxon Mobil. According to uh, Greenpeace researchers, the Koch family foundations alone have spent over $127 million directly financing 92 groups that have attacked climate change science, often climate scientists and policy solutions uh, over the 20 years from 1997 to 2017. In short, the Koch network has for decades now been playing a very sophisticated and integrated long game to protect current and future profits by transforming our country. Here's how Koch himself described the interaction of what he calls the interrelated plays. He said, I often think of what we do as stonemasonry. Once a stone has been carefully selected and set, it shapes a new space in which the mason can set yet another well-chosen stone. Each stone is different, but they all fit together to create a framework that is mutually reinforcing. So let's like take a quick look at that how that careful sequential stonemasonry of mutually reinforcing pieces has brought us to our current moment. The big rollout began in the 2010 midterm elections, in which the radical right deployed unheard of amounts of money in state politics. First, they primaried, a new verb in our time, Republican candidates who saw their job in governing as cooperating uh, for the common good. 
The longtime co-grantee, Grover Norquist, head of Americans for Tax Reform, had explained that success required stark alteration in state government. To quote Norquist, we are trying to change the tone in the state capitals to turn them toward bitter nastiness and partisanship, end quote. Once having driven out those they call the rhinos, who were actually the real Republicans, <laughs> who had been loyal Republicans for years, um, and replaced them with true believers who would practice the required bitter nastiness and partisanship, the donors then put in still more unprecedented money into state races to capture state legislatures, and they succeeded in flipping 20 chambers. It was smart. 2010 was a census year with uh, the potential for redistricting, control of the redistricting process, which they did with a project called Red Map that would enable these new legislators to choose their voters um, uh, rather than voters being able to choose their elected officials. Uh, and they made voters all but irrelevant to governance in many states, including my North Carolina, turning the legislatures into what one political science call, scientist called laboratories of autocracy, not Brandeis's laboratories of democracy, now laboratories of uh, autocracy. Uh, Wisconsin governor, next slide, please, uh, then took a bold action he had never campaigned on. Thank you. Uh, he took away the collective bargaining rights of teachers and most others in the public sector. Proud that he was making history as he regaled his team, Walker then boasted to a caller he believed to be David Koch, we dropped the bomb. In my state of North Carolina, too, we saw a legislative hurricane in 2011 and beyond. The Koch Network, we later learned, had selected us to be a model state for transformation. Slide, please. Uh, these measures inclu included the most extreme and sophisticated gerrymandering ever seen before that targeted vo uh, Black voters with what one judge called almost surgical precision, new measures to undermine workers' ability to organize in unions, particularly in the public sector, attacks in, on public education at all levels and radical cuts in funding for it, while sending tax revenues off to unregulated charter schools, uh, more many other things. And then to cap it off, they passed what came to be known as the Monster Voter Suppression Bill, which aimed to drive down turnout among Black voters and among students who were the most likely groups to oppose all of this. The Koch wave also swept Congress in 2010 under the banner of the Freedom Caucus that went on to shut down the federal government in 2013 to demand radical change it could not get by persuasion. At the end of this week, their successors in the House look likely to hold the American ho economy hostage once again to try to extort radical cuts in funding to pro popular programs they could never otherwise get, and thus continues the right's plan to lay siege to the institutions. Let me go a bit farther back in time, though, briefly, to help us understand that undermining public education has always been a core goal of these radical libertarians. This is actually how I stumbled on all of this. From the very start of their movement back in the 1950s, when the libertarian core numbered fewer than 200, they saw supplanting public education with private schools as crucial to their goal of constricting democracy to liberate market actors. And they were willing then, as now, to leverage racism to achieve their ends. They watched at first from the sidelines, as the state government of Virginia adopted what the segregationists called massive resistance, massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education, a policy then promoted across the Jim Crow South over the vehement ob objections of disenfranchised Black citizens. The official suite of policies adopted in 1956 in Virginia and then spread uh, included tax-funded vouchers for private segregated schools beyond the reach of the federal courts. The state also required the closure of any public schools about to desegregate. Massive resistance caused the Black children of Prince Edward County, Virginia, to be denied any formal schooling from 1959 to 1964, while their white counterparts went off to a private segregation academy with state subsidies. Next slide, please. Uh, in order to stop any black children from going to school with their white counterparts, county leaders boasted that they were 
going out of the public school business entirely. And they did for five years until the federal courts made them reopen public schools. Now, today, most people remember that Prince Edward County fight as uh, and the policy of massive resistance as the cruelest example of the uh, 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 of massive resistance and the last gasp of Jim Crow. But it turns out that it was also the first big opening for today's movement for economic liberty. How so? Key intellectual founders of that cause, including the Chicago economist Milton Friedman, took advantage of the racist reaction to Brown to advance their anti-government agenda. They flocked to the side of Virginia's repressive white elite, thrilled at the tax subsidies for private schools. They framed their alliance with uh, segregationists in economic language, saying it would end the government monopoly of education. Uh, it, next slide. Friedman himself dreamed of a privatization so thorough and so extreme that there would be no taxes to support schools, just parents digging into their own pockets or poorhouses, perhaps providing it. Of that ugly crucible, I will only say one thing more now. The author Maya Angelou was right in saying, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Because what we are seeing now is a kind of sequel on steroids of what the libertarians did then. Now they have additional resources to leverage to achieve their agenda, hostility to feminism, homophobia, and transphobia. And now they can count for numbers, not only on the opponents of black civil rights, but also on highly organized Christian nationalists mobilized with the help of many of the same donors. Also, having won the end of the fairness doctrine in broadcasting during the Reagan years, they have since transformed the media in a manner that allows such arch partisanship and flight from the factual universe. Next slide, please. Indeed, while disinformation was an uninfluential hobby among eccentrics back when the fairness doctrine still held, it has since become a highly lucrative industry with the capacity to sway elections at every level. All of this brings us back to our core question. Why lay siege to public education? Why is attacking public education still so crucial to the radical right 70 years after the Brown decision when so much else has changed in the interim? Do they really need to undermine public schools to enchain democracy? Yes, they do. And they know it. Some, like Will, uh, Kevin Williamson over at National Review, where William F. Buckley is gone and Charles Koch is now an underwriter, are explicit. In what I'm about to quote, you need to realize that these people are so extreme that they call anything government does for the people, including delivering the mail, socialist. Here's what Williamson said, quote, it would be difficult to find in the United States any profession so dedicated to socialism as that of educators and difficult to find any argument for socialism as popular as the cause of public education. He's writing about a decade ago when he said that. In other words, public schools must be defamed, teachers must be defamed precisely because their work leads people to believe in the kind of government that libertarians hate. <sighs> I could say more about that, but I'm going to try to speed up here. Um, why is education so troublesome? Because it's public, <laughs> because it's freely available, not a commodity for purchase, and because at its best, it brings young people together across differences and teaches them to think critically and with empathy in a spirit of free inquiry that often changes minds, as we heard so powerfully last night from David Black. Because you've learned that our nation, like all nations, was not created perfect, but had great aspects and some terrible flaws, and fortunately was a work in progress that later generations improved with fresh vision and social movements. All of this has turned generation after generation into active citizens who believe they have a right to be free from domination and to call on government to ensure that. And the current generation terrifyingly for the fossil fuel corporations like Coke Industries, understands that climate scientists have urgent findings we must act on to save the world we love. And that, my friends, is why the right believes it must undermine public education to achieve its agenda. Because public education represents everything they loathe and want to get rid of, and because its stakeholders 
teachers, parents, students, and administrators stand in the way of their disrupting it, of their smashing and grabbing it as a new massive profit arena for corporations. And the whole gambit can only succeed if they manage to so divide us, to so defame public education, to so weaken educators' ability to defend the public schools that the attackers can then conquer this, get this, it's important, $800 billion industry for private, for-profit corporations and the religious nationalists who seek tax monies for their so-called Christian schools. I don't think they've read the New Testament from what I can tell. Anyway, here again, Mr. Rufo uh, has said as much out loud. Speaking at Hillsdale College last year, Rufo explained, uh, next slide, to get to universal school choice, you really need to operate from a place of universal school distrust. To which we might add, to get to a place of universal school distrust, you need to go scorched earth with deliberate goading of fearful bigotry to subdue rational thinking, to divide the people, and to stir hatred because your agenda is so at odds with the public's, even the voters you need. Recall that four to one poll. That is really why we have seen the conjuring of hysteria uh, about all these subjects in recent years. And that is why so many on the right revere Viktor Orban, the authoritarian governor, uh, the authoritarian head of the Hungarian state, who has been invited to present at the um, uh, Conservative Political Action Conference uh, a few times now. And that is also why authoritarian leader, leaders need to turn school boards partisan and incite disinformed astroturf accomplices like Moms for Liberty because they cannot destroy public education only from the top down. They also need what Steve Bannon calls useful chaos agents on the ground who can help the officials to achieve their goals. Bannon has also said, and I quote, School boards are the key that picks the lock to build political power. Like Mao's cultural revolution in China, the Pinochet junta's shock troops in Chile, and Orban's dictatorial regime in Hungary, strong men need enablers in captured media. They need parents denouncing heretics to employers. They need children informing on their teachers. They need committed teachers to flee the profession to weaken it, as is happening in Florida most dramatically, where the number of teacher vacancies has tripled since 2019 to hit a stunning 7,000. They need to apply acid to the bonds of trust and mutual regard that sustain healthy societies. And they need administrators to cower, to go silent in fear of punishment, of lost monies. Recall Grover Norquist's call for bitter nastiness and partisanship as the route to success. And imagine seeing that as a formula for anything good. Is that not what we see now? Nasty bitterness and partisanship? But here's the good news. All of these interrelated plays only work so long as we do not understand the plays themselves and the long game they serve. Because knowledge of those is power, and to that power, we can bring additional power to bear. Knowing that the right can only succeed by dividing us, by turning communities against one another to fracture the protective phalanx we would otherwise maintain, we can flip the script and put them on the defensive. We can build mutual support and collective power to save our schools and our democracy. As Bishop uh, William Barber of North Carolina, uh, who first came to prominence when Koch allies funded school board candidates in Wake County in 2009 to take down a successful integration program, says, slide please, we is the most important word in the progressive vocabulary. We is the most important word in the progressive vocabulary. For as history shows us, the only way to defeat organized money is organized people. 
and educators are among the most organized people in the country, right? Am I right? <laughs> every community, every district, every state, every media market, et cetera. Think back to the Red for Ed movements that swept the country in 2018. Why were teachers so successful? That's why. And also because teachers together have built so much goodwill and trust. Trust that can be revived and deepened now to save our schools and our students' futures. Next slide, please. Imagine the power of teachers doing deep canvassing together in teams in our communities over the coming year, knocking doors, opening conversations to let people know what is really happening and how high the stakes are. That would be something. One thing seems very clear to me as a scholar of U.S. social movements. The deeper the connections we forge and the conversations we share over these next few days, the more successful we will be in reclaiming the freedom to teach and with it saving our imperiled public schools and the principle of government of, by, and for the people. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Or? Do you want to take questions? Sure, yes. Yeah. Um, do we have the index cards for questions? I think we could just take them. You want to just take questions? Yeah. Okay, we'll just take questions just a few, for about but... 15 minutes. Okay, do we have that time? And Great. We'll okay. about, yeah, 15 minutes, and then we can Fabulous. have a coffee break. Okay. I know it's a lot, as my nephew says, <laughs> a lot to absorb, but I also know that so many of you have experienced these things personally, you know, have been the subject of attacks from these groups like Moms for Liberty um, and uh, are seeing these things play out in your community. So I'm, I'm eager to hear from you and take any questions or challenges. Yes. I'm just, I, I couldn't hear that well. I heard the first part. Um, could you repeat? Oh, the mic is coming around, I think. Very, very thoughtful question. Yes, they spend a great deal of time trying to package this cause as ethical, as liberty. They also subsidize, you won't be surprised to know, uh, uh, um, religious thinkers. They try to develop a, a theology that would support all of this. I was actually just at Creighton University, a Catholic school um, in Omaha, where the faculty are organizing to preserve their social justice mission um, against the Koch Center, because there's 100 years of Catholic social justice teaching, which goes against all of this. So you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that was, I, I didn't know anything about libertarianism when I did this book. I was started with that Prince Edward County story and kept pulling the threads. And, I, you know, this is where it led me. But um, um, you know, what I've realized that there is that there is a libertarian ethical system. You know, they actually do believe very strongly that they are ethical people and they have persuaded themselves of this, but it's an ethical system that is at odds with the best of the religious teaching of every denomination, every major faith in the world, which all has, you know, compassion for uh, the poor, you know, uh, care for the sick, welcome the stranger, all of those kinds of things. So they are really up against it <laughs> with people who take ethics seriously. And I'm, I'm glad that you raised that question. Yes, I see over here. And then uh, uh, up there. Yeah. I see it uh, clearly in the margins of, of much of what you spoke about, especially when you take us back to Brown v. Board mm -hmm. and the uh, resistance to integrating the schools. Today, how significantly intertwined do you see the libertarian long game with the project of white nationalism? Thank you for that question. I mean, one thing that uh, is really important to understand in all of this is you cannot sustain the libertarian philosophy or its ethical system without some version of 
social Darwinism, right? That if you are going to say that this society, this profit-based society, which is going to have incredible winners and so many losers and hurt people, you cannot do that unless you provide a rationale. And they have, actually, when I was in Buchanan's office, he had William Graham Sumner's book near his desk, the famous social Darwinist. Yeah. Um, And, you know, they love Herbert Spencer, the founder of social Darwinism in the UK. So that has always been part of of all of this. Um, And uh, and one thing that also um, European scholars have identified is what they call the libertarian to alt-right um, uh, pipeline that so many libertarians, because they believe those kinds of things that encode you know, uh, ideas about race um, and nationality and who's deserving and who's able and who's not, many of them slip off to the alt-right. Uh, so, so there is that kind of uh, connection, but also they are starting to panic because they know most of the people don't agree with what they're doing. You know, since all of this started to roll out, you know, people on the the progressive side, you know, across different kinds of issue silos and other things, many in the progressive faith world, I'm seeing uh, Reverend Paul McAllister, my my friend from North Carolina, here in the front row. Um, so people are responding to this, and we saw unprecedented turn out in the midterms of 2018, you know, 2020 election, 2022. So they're getting very nervous about whether this will all go through. And so they're relying more and more on these Christian nationalists um, and on unseemly others. And as um, uh, my friend Tarso Ramos at at, um, uh, Political Research Associates puts it, they study the right they have for for decades, he said, alliances of convenience have become strategic partnerships, (laughs) right? So things that just started as, hey, let's, you know, let's, uh, you know, get together and get these voters out. Now they're really working much more closely, you know, in terms of weaponizing these prejudices of all kinds to make sure they can get their base to the polls and not have them thinking about the policies that would actually make their lives better. Thank you for that. I see, yeah, Brett, who I know has been in the eye of the storm, right? Hi, I want to thank you for being here and the organizer for the conference. And I really want to thank all of you who've come. I think we all understand where we are in Florida, the epicenter of all that's happening. My question is as much a comment, but also I really want to find out if you're aware. I feel strongly because almost two years ago, I had a parent come after my African-American history class, challenging a textbook. I'm a panelist later and I'll be happy to share my insights. But the bottom line is, you know, I've been on the front lines through no choice of my own just because I'm teaching history here in Florida. But it seems to me that what we need to do is really galvanize the public. You know, National Public Radio did a survey about a year and a half ago. They asked parents and guardians across the country, do you support your child's public school? Do you support your child's public school teacher? And do you support what's being taught? And 75 to 80 percent of parents and guardians said they did. And I have tremendous respect for fellow citizens. But, you know, many of our fellow citizens are working really hard. They don't have a sense of what's going on. My question is, how can we organize a nationwide campaign of public service announcements mm-hmm. by public school teachers, 15 to 30 second spots where we're kind and decent, but fierce and credible in standing up to these charges and educating the public that we are doing the best we can for your children. We're not here to indoctrinate, sexualize, or groom them. And I wish that I could get some insights from you because I've been advocating this for a couple of years. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not seeing it gain traction. You know, I can make daily TikTok videos like I do, <laughs> but I'm just one person. And I really want to yeah. find out well, I have this opportunity. How can we galvanize public school teachers to put together a campaign like that? Wow. Uh, I think that that is a a, a brilliant idea. Uh, One thing I would say, and I learned this from the great linguist, George Lakoff, don't think of an elephant who who does framing, never repeat the frame you're being attacked with because it reinforces the frame. So don't say we're not whatever they say we are, but instead say who you are and lead with your values. But I think what you describe is fantastic. Um, And we have, I saw David Blight waving his hand as the incoming president of the Organization of American Historians. And we also have the executive director of the American Historical Association uh, here, um, and people from many, many other uh, history organizations. So I think that we can be talking about these things going forward over these next few days, how to do something like that, how to get it funded. I think it's critically important. And I do want people, because I think so many teachers now feel so embattled, so under the gun, you know, as I said, people fleeing the profession, 
think back to 2018 and the Red for Ed movement, if you were part of that, because you had community support everywhere. In West Virginia, where it started, it was all 59 counties in West Virginia, and the parents knew that the teachers were the ones who stood you know, in the breach during the opioid crisis, during all these other things. So I think we need to get off the defensive, you know, get back, reinvigorate those relationships with the parents who aren't paying attention as to opposed to the ones who are being funded to go out and attack schools. I could not agree with you more. The positive message needs to go forward. And honestly, I would love to see teachers on the doors, <laughs> making sure that people are thinking about who's in their state legislatures and whether they are, those people are good for schools or whether they need to be replaced with candidates that are good for schools, including I see my friend Christina Marsh over here who will be speaking uh, tomorrow. Christina and I met um, at some hearings in DC on the Janus case and Christina was voted teacher of the year in Arizona um, for her work and then later found herself in the eye of this kind of storm uh, and decided to run for the legislature. Um, and she is now in the Arizona legislature. So there are many approaches um, that people can take, um, uh, but, but um, what you say I think is really important. And I think we were all blindsided. Maybe we shouldn't have been, but we were like, where did this come from? And so I think a lot of people just you know, we're sort of shell shocked. But as Mike has said, you know, in, in um, organizing this conference, it's like the initial shock is wearing off, you know, and now people want to do things and your idea is fantastic. So thank you for it, Brant. Uh, yes, here and, and Mike, you'll keep track of time and then up there and then David. Thank you. This has been excellent. I'm Kathy Gates. I'm also on the panel with Brant. Okay. And I'm from Hernando County. We were ground zero back in May fighting um, Moms for Liberty. In fact, the Washington Post did an op-ed on us. Uh, what we are starting to notice, you need to be aware of, um, yes, they're going after public schools. It's now morphing into going after our public libraries. Um, two counties near me, they're starting to go to commission meetings. They want no funding for the ALA. Apparently, the president has, you know, stated her views on certain things and they have run with it. So now we are also attacking and trying to destroy our public libraries. Thank you so much for uh, pointing that out and reminding people. I should also say, again, remember, these are libertarians. All they want, armies, courts, and police. They hate the idea of public libraries. They think we should have fee-paying places to get, you know, go to a bookstore, buy your books, or go to a fee, you know, based place, um, but they don't want public libraries. Uh, so that is a logical next step for them. But again, I think these things are terribly unpopular. And what if we had concerned citizens who want to protect the libraries being having tables in the libraries to let them know what is happening and say, hey, if you want to keep coming back to this library and you want it to survive, become part of our effort to protect this library, right? And to support our embattled librarians. I really think that we need to do this because the way that it, it's, it's ugly. I mean, remember that Grover Norquist quote, right? We want to create nasty, bitter, bitter nastiness and partisanship. And so that toxicity drives a lot of people away. But I think we have to really, you know, do the yoga breathing, right? But come back and defend these institutions that are so important to all of us and to our being able to be together as a diverse, multiracial, gender inclusive uh, democratic society. Okay. Nancy, you just showed why we have historians. That was beautiful and brilliant. Uh, is anyone familiar with the bicentennial minutes in 1976? I can't remember. I remember well. I was a high school teacher walking around in my 1776 medallion and all that. And they tended to be quite patriotic, which was fine, but they were, they were history. Now, they probably were funded by TV networks. I'm not sure. Yeah. But I love the idea of trying to get them the money. And certainly our little Senator Yale could produce these. These are simple to produce, but it takes money to get them on television. Um, and maybe at the coffee break or lunch break, there, mm -hmm. there, there are many years of organizations here from AHA to uh, the Social Studies Council to the Free Speech Organization. 
let's gather at some point, maybe lunch, whatever, and get our heads together on this because there's thousands of teachers who would do this. Yes. And many of us who would do it on their behalf. Thank you. Uh, here? Oh, you have, I guess you have a better sense, Deja, of who was in order. I mean, to be to be really scary, we could talk about Argentina and Brazil and in Chile in the seventies, who uh, who re really went for the libertarian um, ideal, and you know a lot of people disappeared. We had military dictatorships. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I actually have a chapter in Democracy in Chains called A Constitution of Locks and Bolts, because this individual that I wrote about, James Buchanan, who advised changes significant enough to amount to a constitutional revolution, he was in, in, uh, invited to Chile by the Pinochet Junta to de help devise a constitution that could shackle democracy for when the country went back to civilian government. Um, and we saw in 2019, the uprising, it was called, in Chile against that constitution and against the privatization of public education and retirement security that the regime had affected and locked in with that, that constitution. Uh, and three quarters of Chileans voted for a referendum to change that constitution of locks and bolts is what Michelle Bachelet, a previous president, called it. Um, but then their constitutional convention, the forces who were going to draft a new constitution, were not very well organized and came up with such a long and bewildering document that people voted for the devil they knew rather than this new thing. So I think that's also a lesson that when you have forces who are so organized, so strategic, playing such a long game, it is really important to start rowing together to have have communications to create more alignment so that people are working for uh, common goals together. This is the part of the program where <laughs> I get to be the bad guy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank Mike, you. for bringing us together. Um, That's amazing. Join me in thanking Dr. McLean for that wonderful presentation. Um, as part of the dialogue that David referenced, we have built in some coffee breaks for people to get to know each other for people to network and discuss ideas and strategies. So we have approximately 25 minutes before our next panel begins at 11 a.m. Um, the next time we have questions, please introduce yourself. Uh, let us know who you are. And um, I think what we just learned is validation that the best history inherently should make you uncomfortable. See you at 11. <laughs>